talk about. Hub. She's quite poor. Hello and welcome, my name is Ian, this channel is all about music and art and this is where we talk about music and art and in this video I'm going to look back at what's happening regarding music streaming in the UK uh, and over the last couple of months the UK government's Digital Culture, Media and Sports Committee have been looking into the way that streaming platforms and large record companies manage payments to songwriters, musicians and performers. And on the 15th of October 2020, Parliament published a news article stating that this particular committee would inquire into the impact of streaming on the future of the music industry. The article stated that the inquiry will consider whether the government should take action to protect the industry from piracy in the wake of steps taken by the EU on copyright and intellectual property rights. I knew that some high profile musicians were giving evidence to this committee and the first of these meetings was on the 24th of November and uh, another meeting on the 8th of December. Now these meetings were long, lasting over three hours each. So what I've done is, is I've edited them down into shorter videos and I have put direct links to the questions in the description down below, which will make it easier for you if you want to look at a specific question and not watch the whole thing. It's worth providing a background to the witnesses giving evidence in this second session from December the 4th. We have Fiona Bevan, a singer-songwriter from Suffolk, who has written songs with a host of top artists, including Ed Sheeran. There is also Soweto Kinch, the jazz alto saxophonist and rapper, who has so far written and released seven albums. And last but not least, we have Nas Rogers, who is a songwriter, producer, guitarist and leader of the band Chic. All of the sessions were chaired by Julian Knight, and the complete list of committee members and the relevant links are in the description down below. Now this recording is made in agreement with the UK Parliament Terms and Conditions, which state that I cannot alter the video or the audio of the recording in any way. I can't use this material for satire or use it on websites or social media platforms that promote, encourage and facilitate illegal activity and encourage hatred and antisocial behaviour. So here is part one of session two into the economics of music streaming. Order, order. This Digital Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee and this is our second panel today in our inquiry into the economics of music streaming. We're joined by uh, Fiona Bevin, songwriter and singer, uh, Sweta Kinch, a jazz saxophonist, MC and composer, and Niall Rogers, a songwriter, producer and artist. Thank you very much for joining us this morning, uh, and thank you as well, Niall, as I understand you're in the United States as well, so thank you for that. Um, just one bit of housekeeping, if I may. Could the witnesses, could you place yourselves on mute until you're called to answer? There, there's, no inter there's no sound interference, then, if that's OK. Thank you very much. Our first question is going to come from Steve Bryan. Steve Bryan. Steve Bryan. Hello. Hello, yes. Could you, you're, you're called to question. Yeah, sorry, I wasn't, um, wasn't, un, wasn't unmuting my end. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. I don't know whether you've had a chance to listen to the evidence that has been given so far, uh, either before or in today's session, but um, last week we had um, recording artists, Sonny John Ray, forming from Gomez, and Ed, Ed O'Brien from Radiohead, uh, and others talking to us about what they question. believe. From Steve Bryan. Steve Bryan. What, right, okay. Uh, what, what they believe is very little transparency in the process. I just wonder, um, let, let's start with you, Fiona. Hi. Um, whether you believe that, that that's something you'd agree with. Um, both as artists, both as songwriters, whether th this is a, a process that is cloaked in mystery. Yes, I would have to agree that the lack of transparency is a really, really big problem. Um, I'm an independent artist as well as a songwriter for other artists. And so we've talked quite a lot on these sessions so far about artists and performers. So my big focus today is to talk about songwriters. Mm. Um, but I can speak from both 
points of view. Mm. But yes, the lack of transparency, any any songwriter will know that when they get their PRS statement and see the streaming income, it's all 0.0003 for this, 0.0005 for that. And in different countries, it's different amounts. We don't know the rates for each country because of the NDAs between the streaming platforms and the publishers and labels. And so, yeah, it's basically unauditable um, and it's, it's kind of incalculable because these tiny, tiny sums, well, I mean, you've probably seen some of the stats, but one of the stats that the Ivers have just published is that eight out of 10 songwriters earn less than 200 pounds a year from streaming. So we have a big problem here. And people don't know why they're getting so little. Yeah. They don't know where it's coming from. There are many bodies taking a little cut along the way. If you look at dissecting the digital pound. So yeah, there's there's a lot to unpick there. Mm. Okay, so then just as initial thoughts, Soweto, what, you, what are your thoughts? You're nodding, uh, nodding there during that answer from Fiona. Transparency. You need to unmute and uh, but yeah. if, you, if you and if you and Mr. Rogers unmute, then you'll be ready to rock. Absolutely. Um, yeah, there was some confusion in the first session as to whether this lack of transparency is by default or by design. Well, it's definitely by design. And it's something that I've seen throughout my career as a self-releasing artist, an independent song, songwriter, jazz musician as well. Uh, there are people with vested interests in keeping that system as opaque and un sort of unintelligible as possible, because if you don't know what to ask for, then you don't know how much you're entitled to. And that goes, that went back to the days when I wanted to put out a record myself and people say, oh, AP2 licenses and barcodes as if it was really complex stuff when actually it was just a couple of phone calls and emails away. I think there are still people with a vested interest in making you get the impression this is all really difficult to sort out and it's all so polarized and dissipated that you'll never be able to collect all this revenue. Well, actually, it's never been easier to collect metadata. You don't have to go around to every pub that your song is played in. You can, there is a digital trail for all of this music as it's being played on all these different platforms. So, um, yeah, I think we shouldn't have much time for these agencies sort of pleading poverty or that it's really difficult in this time of COVID. Because one of the most egregious things is that my journey has involved going from being an artist with an independent label who could be guaranteed some royalties to relying pretty heavily on live gigs, live engagements, and selling my own merchandise, my self-released merchandise on my sets. With the complete dissipation, the evisceration of all my live gigs this year, that's no longer a possibility. Record labels have been trying to encroach on that live merch world for a while now with 360 deals, etc. And it just seems really pernicious to be complaining that it's more difficult for them when as artists, we can't earn anything from live um, as Fiona quite eloquently put out that stat that the MU and others have mentioned today, that eight out of 10 musicians earn less than 200 pounds. Well, when apparently I think the top three labels have generated 4.2 billion pounds this year, in the year of COVID, it just looks purely like market failure. It shouldn't be any other discussion other than how can that be right? And what sort of detrimental effects is that going to have on music creators, not just me personally and how I interface with it, but sort of what music from Britain sounds like. We'd never have a Kate Bush or a David Bowie in today's music ecology because there's this very risk averse and there aren't people making those sorts of investments. And for an independently minded artist like that, you're making songs for playlists. You're making songs for a very narrow sonic wall. You're not making the sort of incredible musical risks that a Bowie or somebody like Rod Stewart might have taken decades ago. So sorry mm. for my rant, but I'll hold no, 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 that all no, no, for an hour and a half. I have, I have a feeling that a number of things you just said will be making it into our final um, report. And there's some brilliant, brilliant comments in there about market failure in particular. Um, and then, Mr. Rogers, pleasure to meet you. Um, tell us your thoughts on non-disclosure agreements in the industry, your experience of them, and and this whole issue of transparency and whether 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 you feel without putting words in your head that that it is presented as all being very complicated not something that artists need to worry their heads about when actually as Soweto says it's not really that complicated at all no um i just want to simply say i've been doing this um 
God, I started with Sesame Street 1970 or 71. I've been doing this all my life. And I look at the record labels as my partners. And the interesting thing about my partners <laughs> is that every time I have audited my partners, every single time I find money, every time. Um, every, you, you know, so the thing is, is that we must, we absolutely must have transparency. What There's no, I, I mean, there should be a wonderful relationship between both parties. I mean, partners are happy when both parties are happy. And the only time that we really get to check to see if things are the way they should be is we go in and audit. And every single time, and I am not making this up for dramatic purposes or comedic purposes, but every single time I have audited a label, I have found money. And sometimes it's staggering the amount of money. And that's because of the way that the system was designed right from the beginning. Um, with the way the system's set up now with, with all of these relationships between the labels under NDA and now we can no longer see, we don't even know what a stream is worth. I mean, does anyone, and I, and I look at a very learned group of people here, does anyone, can anyone actually really tell me what a stream is actually worth? Yeah, you can. <laughs> and there's no way you can even find it. Uh, you, there's no way you can find out what a stream is worth. And that's not a good partnership. I don't look at my record label partners as enemies. I look at them as my friends. I go to dinner with them. I, you know, when I'm in the south of France and I see Lucian, we're the happiest people in the world. But at the same time, uh, you, you know, COVID has given me a real opportunity to drill down on my numbers. And I am completely shocked. I love what the gentleman said. You know, I, I never thought about it that much because my touring revenue has been so substantial, I could support my entire organization. When when we were on tour with Cher and we were going into lockdown, I gave all my band members and all my crew a big advance. I had no idea what was gonna happen. And only a few weeks ago, I did the same thing. Um, and that's because I'm in partnership with record companies for the rest of my life. So I do have a revenue stream that's coming in. But now that streaming has become the default mechanism uh, when it comes to, distrib to distribution, and we know it's a great one, so it's never going to go backwards, now is the perfect time to fix this stuff. Um, and, and let me just say very simply, because I don't want to rant. I, I have a, a real problem with talking way too much. But I just want to say something. And this is just very sober from my heart. Um, <sighs> right now, we see with the companies um, exponential growth. We see their numbers going up and up and up. Why? Because streaming is an incredibly effective way to distribute the product. As we have all learned in math class, this is simple, basic stuff. When you have continued exponential growth mathematically, what's the next thing that happens? Explosive growth, right? You have explosive growth. That's what's on the horizon. Why not fix these problems now? Because they know that what's coming is explosive growth for the labels. They are going to make more. If you think they're making a lot of money now, what do you think they're going to make in four years? Mm. It's going to be astronomical. So, so now you is the time make your partners happy like let's go into a room have an organization that represents songwriters and artists at the table and say look we love you guys we're in business together for the rest of our lives let's make it right let's make it fair now because your stockholders your shareholders are going to be thrilled because you're getting ready to experience explosive growth in the next few years Let's pay these people what they should have been making all along, and we're going to be one big happy family. Bingo and done. Mm. Well, you're famously a very hopeful and positive person, 
uh, which is which is great to hear. But how much hope do you have that that will happen? Because, I mean, we are the Culture, Media and Sport Committee of, of the UK Parliament. And w- obviously, we, we, we look a lot at football. Football is a is a massive business. Um, and, and, you know, the Premier League here in England is huge with huge revenues. The talent in that context is the footballers. The footballers are incredibly well remunerated. Um, there is no market failure as far as they are concerned. I'm sure, I'm sure some would like more, but there's no market failure as far as they are concerned. They share in the, the bounty. Um, how, how hopeful are you, Niall, that, that, that the vision that you outline will actually happen? Without change, without change in 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 statute, which is what we are obviously capable of proposing, I, I, I'm extraordinarily hopeful because I think it makes sense. the 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 difference is is that when you're talking about sport, the the player is played for what they're doing at that moment. With music and IP, what we get paid for is the thing that we do at that moment but the fact that it's consumed well after we've done it. <laughs> so, um, you, you know, when I was a kid and I studied music and I looked at my old heroes, uh, you know, the ones that did well who were the ones who got a job uh, working for the church or working for a lord or working at court or, or you know, things like that. So we, we knew as musicians we were going to grow up pretty much being poor. Well, the thing that changed that paradigm was recorded music, was music that could actually be played while I'm not standing in that place, right? I mean, in other words, like, I don't have to be standing where the where my music is being consumed. So we came up with an, an, a mechanism to remunerate me for not having to be in that place, but you still getting to enjoy what I, what I do. You get to enjoy my work. That system has always been cloudy at best but now we have a chance a great opportunity because we know we absolutely know we all learn this in math school we all learn this we all learn that if you're in the knee of some if you're in the knee of a technological curve and you have and you're experiencing exponential growth then the thing that follows exponential is explosive that means it's going to go wham, way up. We are not going to go backwards. We watched this happen when CDs were introduced into the marketplace. We went from analog to digital. Once we entered this digital world and we could replicate something over and over and over and over again, and the quality stayed the same, oh my God, that was a huge, huge revolution. We're never going backwards. It's always going to get nothing but better. Thank there- you. And, and just, 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 just finally, then, and it's interesting you you talk about you know future proofing, if you like. This is a moment to future proof because yes, you're right. The the artistry that that you that you guys put in is around for for a long time after you have created it. Unlike a, unlike a sports professional, um, and and that is only going to change as tech. Technology change, isn't it? Because perform performances, and maybe COVID will be the instigator of this. Performances will be on recorded tape, but who, who knows what technology will bring? Who knows what avatars will of you, Nile, will appear at Glastonbury in the future, um, doing doing your craft? Um, and uh, there's a thought. And, and you know, how will you uh, or your estate, God forbid, one day be paid for that? You are, you, you've just explained it perfectly. As, as the technology changes, and say, for example, that scenario you just described is the future. That IP should have a way of being, uh, we should have a way of calculating it. We should have a way of of understanding how the industry sets a price. And the best way that we would have an understanding is if we're sitting at the table, mm. right? We we need to represent ourselves. We need to have someone sitting there representing us. And you, you I think we all know the reason why that hasn't happened because it's a bit of a conundrum. The, the, the labels which own the recorded music, it's hard for them to fight for the people who've made the recorded music because it seems like you're fighting against yourself. 
but it's not really true. We are partners. And if you just sort of look at us as family, as you, you know, it, it's artists are really at a disadvantage. And I'm just going to go off topic just for a moment. We're really at a disadvantage because all my life I've seen when, you know, Mick Jagger walks in the room or David Bowie walks in the room or Diana Ross walks in the room or Madonna, and we see the executives, we see the CEOs. It's a big smile on our face because we look at them. It's like they're the people who are looking out for us. They're the people that are our partners. They're taking care of us because artists intrinsically believe I you know not not everyone, so don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to speak in absolute terms, but we intrinsically believe that we are in a good business. We're in a business of giving love and sharing art, and we believe that these people are in that business because they love the music and they love the people who make the music. If somehow they could just sort of turn around and see it from our side, and if they can't, let us have the power to have representation that can show them our side, that can speak for our side. Um, and I think that things would be very, very different very quickly. And the outcome and the, the growth and the finances that everyone would make would be fine. Everybody would be happy. You don't have to have somebody way up here and we're way down here. That's just ridiculous. Why can't we come like this? And there's, they're still going to make a hell of a lot more than we make. But still, if you can bring it a little bit more into balance, it would make a lot more sense and we'd be a lot happier. And why should we have to suffer the way we're suffering now? Half of my revenue is just out the window right now because of COVID. Nothing I can do about it. I'm not blaming anyone for that. But right now, if we had a better system, and we had transparency. As I said, not one person could tell me what a stream is worth. Not one. That, th thank you, Niles. Uh, just, no, just, I'm just going to just say at this point, we, we have about an hour left of the session, so I'm going to ask for just a, bit, uh, just a tiny bit of brevity just in terms of answers and response, if that's okay. Uh, Steve, have you finished your questions? Will you do anything else? Yeah, I just wonder whether Soweto wanted to add something to that. Yeah. He, he, he was itching in his seat there. I, I <laughs> um, but, but other than that, thank Please, you. Please, Soweto. You're, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just to um, expound on what you've eloquently described there now, if we are in a relationship with labels, though often that relationship is abusive, and I can't underline enough how iniquitous the pro rata settlement that we have at the moment with songs are. That means the top 10 streaming artists get all of the miscellaneous revenue. In short, it produces ridiculous stats like 80% of subscribers on a platform like Deezer, their money goes to artists they've never listened to. Their subscriptions go to artists they've never listened to. Or a situation in which, as I said, if I create my Magnus Opus and thousands of people listen to it, not making it personal, but Dua Lipa, Ed Sheeran, the top 10 streaming artists get all of that money. Now, as again, as Niall said, you know, in a year that we're normally touring and got live revenues and t-shirt sales, you might not notice that. But in a year when all of that's dried up, how can it be right? that we have a pro rata rather than a user they call it a user based agreement in which people could feel like they are supporting their artists more directly and specifically with my genre jazz music um, three to six percent of its value is suppressed by this current model if it was a user based system then alternative genres and I can't underline how important these genres are. I was lucky to hear Mr. Rogers speaking about his own musical journey and loving bebop at a certain time, you know. I've stayed in that zone as a jazz musician, but we wouldn't have the funk, the hip hop, the other genres that without musicians taking a left turn sometimes, without getting into avant-garde things that aren't just profitable in the short term, but work on their chops and develop a different musical ear. That, as I mentioned before, produces a uh, Kate Bush or Rod Stewart, things that we can be proud of as a country. If that's not happening, then we're not going to hear those voices in the future. It's all going to sound very myopic, very narrow and very similar. Okay, thank you. Kevin Brennan. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you to our three witnesses for the music and uh, the great pleasure you've brought to all of us uh, over the years. Um, Fiona, if I, it's nice to see you again. If I could start with you. Um, but we, we've obviously heard in evidence about the split, the streaming revenue, you know, 55% goes to the recording side, 15% to the song. 
Um, why do you think that is? Well, it comes from an archaic split where the labels had huge physical overheads to produce vinyl and CDs, to store them and ship them. And, and we've heard about breakage as well during these sessions. Of course, very few people buy physical nowadays and streaming has taken over utterly. Mm. Um, and it's, and streaming, streaming has even supplanted downloads. So there's not really an excuse for these huge behemoth companies to have 55% when they don't have these physical overheads anymore. It's yeah, very, yeah, very yeah. cheap for them to distribute the music. So 15% is still going yeah. to the publishing. 15% is what the song itself gets. And 55% mm. is the record, the recording. Mm. And that, to me, is at the very, very fundamental basis of the problem. Because okay. If that's I, a bit more even, yeah. songwriters would actually be able to survive. Mm. Right now, they're driving Ubers. Hit songwriters are driving Ubers. I was going to uh, sort of answer my next question in a way. I was going to ask you, and I hesitate to ask you this question because you're not an up-and-coming songwriter. You're obviously a very well-established songwriter who's had very big hits. But um, what is the impact of that on people coming into the industry as songwriters, do you think? Well, yeah, it's absolutely devastating. You know, I'm a guest lecturer quite often at universities. All these brilliant young students who are on commercial songwriting courses, popular music courses, they're all emerging from university with maybe £50,000 debt into this landscape, which has been utterly decimated. And it's very difficult for me to say to them, yes, songwriting is a great career to go into. Because, as I've said, eight out of ten songwriters earn less than £200 a year. Mm. And, you know, I had a track on an album that was number one, very recently, number one in the album charts in the UK. That track, and that was the fastest selling solo artist album of the year at the time of release. And that track has earned me about £100. Mm. And, and what, was, what, what was your share of the song in that, um, Fiona? Are you able to tell us? Or? It was about 45, 48%. Right, okay. So basically almost a 50-50. Yeah. yeah. So basically the song had earned £200 effectively for songwriters. Yeah, so songwriters are these invisible people behind the scenes who are actually writing the songs. I mean, often it's the artist as well, but if you look at the charts, the vast majority of music in the charts is written through collaborations and teams. Mm songwriters and producers and artists together, or producers and songwriters together. And, um, you know, these are the most successful songs in the country and in the world. Yeah. So we've had a lot of talk from independent musicians on the last session, but these, but pop songwriters, the most successful songwriters in the world, can't pay their rent. So there, okay. that's, the, that's the depth of the problem. Uh, thank you, thank you, Fiona. Soweto, um, it's interesting this, isn't it? Because uh, actually the publishing, uh, music publishing industry is dominated these days by the same corporations that dominate the record industry. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but, uh, <laughs> but why uh, do you think that it's turned out that um, they haven't been as forceful in pushing the interests for a share for their publishing arms as they have been for the, uh, for the record? Well, they are behaving slightly like cartels, really, and the numbers of the ways in which their interests overlap and interleave are quite shocking once you discover them as an artist on the outside. The model for a jazz composer is actually quite interesting, and if you're independent, you'd be looking to pay splits to a composer, a band arranger, songwriters, lyric writers, etc. And it's, as Fiona implies, quite a team of people. And I guess the labels have a vested interest in diminishing that share so they don't have to pay arrangers, composers, etc. And you could, I suspect in the olden days, have a sustained career from being an arranger, from being a composer. Um, when I myself do lectures and, and teach university undergrads to say, look, we need people in PR, we need people to organize, to curate shows and to arrange and compose. But if all of the income is either coming to the star performer or the back end in the label, then it doesn't make the idea of being a, an arranger professionally or a composer particularly viable. Okay, all right. Thanks, uh, thanks, Soweto. And um, you know, I think it also, 
in the in the origin of all of this, the, 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 the I think the record companies also had a stake in the in the streaming services themselves as well, probably, which is a reason why it might have been set up that way. Um, yeah. If I could come to, um, to 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 Niall, if um, is he still with us? Are you still there, Niall? I think I am. Oh, you are good. Right, okay, I lost you there for a second. Sorry, sorry. Now, thank you. By the way, it must be very early in the morning where you are, but so thank you for joining us. Um, uh, no, I, I've read your um, autobiography a couple of years ago, and it's an incredible. You've had an incredible life, and it's an extraordinary story. What what's sort of motivated you to really want to speak out on this issue today? So I feel that the UK is one of the most important um, musical um, engines in the world. I mean, you know, you've read my book, so you know the first song I ever learned to play was the Beatles' the Day in the Life. And I now am uh, Chief Creative Advisor at Abbey Road Studios. So I am very, very fond of the UK. Also, it's given me a second career. I, um, you know, um, Ireland put sheep back on the map, you mm. know, 15, 20 years ago, and it's been incredible ever since. But but I, I would just like to say something, because you're right, it's really early in the morning for me, and if you know anything about musicians, <laughs> <laughs> I had to get up at 5 a.m., which was only about an hour after I... You've yeah, been uh, up all night, tell us the truth. Yeah, yeah I am. Uh, <laughs> Honestly, but I wrote this down before I fell asleep because I thought that this was really important and I wanted my words to be sober and clear and not hostile so you understand where we're coming from. This just hit me last night. A music stream should be treated as a license, not a sale. Think about that. This is really, really important. A license gives the artist 50% of the royalties for a song, whereas a sale gives the artist between 15, I mean, between 18 and 30%. So since streaming became the main mechanism for consuming music, record companies have, an unil have, have unilaterally decided that a stream is considered a sale because it maximizes their profits. Mm. Duh. This hit me right before I fell asleep. And okay. it made all the sense in the world. Uh, in the old days, we would buy a CD, and that was a sale. That was something we owned, right? And, and there's a big difference. Or like those bicycles that are on the street that you can just put your credit card in and ride on the bicycle, but you have to return it. It's not your bicycle to keep forever. Um, anyway, sorry, I don't want to go off topic. Okay. Uh, okay. Let, let me just, please, just let me finish. Um, so, of course. Artists and songwriters need to update clauses in their contracts to reflect the true nature of how their songs are being consumed, which is via a license. They're not being consumed via a sale. It's consumed being a license, something that people are borrowing from. But we're, meanwhile, we're getting the remuneration doesn't, doesn't correspond to the action. Okay. And, Th th thanks, Niall. I'm glad you, you were able to put that um, on the record for the for the uh, committee. Can I just ask you just one last question? Because I don't want to hog the time, and others um, want to to get in. There's been a, a, a whole sequence of interesting developments recently with very well established songwriters um, selling off the the right to the future income of their of their catalogues, including the news that Bob Dylan's just done it. I think um, this mm -hmm. week, um, selling his for three hundred million dollars, reportedly, and also. You know, obviously there have been others recently, and you've been involved in in, in working uh, in, with a, a a company that is sort of acquiring those sorts of song rights and future streams of income. But what do you think is happening there? Is there is there a development going on that committee should be aware of of why this is happening in this way at this time? Yeah, I think that 
for the first time, artists are starting to realize that their songs need to be managed just as their performances have been managed, just like the the other aspects of their careers have been managed. And what we're doing, I don't know what Universal is doing, I can't speak for them, but what we're doing at Hypnosis is we're managing the songs. What we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that the artist songs perform at the peak of their, it, it, we want to make sure that that artists are really being uh, taken care of. Artists and songwriters are not fairly remunerated for their streams. The streams, like it's as much as I love the the convenience. The, the the fact is is the system the the system I tell you it's six in the morning for me the <laughs> system is is unfair we need to have tra- transparency and if you can help us make this happen things would change and I guarantee you two years down the road everybody's going to be fine and happy because I am telling you we are going to experience explosive growth, mathematical, okay. explosive growth. Thank you, Niall. And back to you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Kevin. So thanks so much for watching. The next video will be a continuation of this second session.